Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's discussion of the topic Opportunity Beckons for Smart Investors. Uh, you can be forgiven for not knowing it based on the kind of media coverage you're getting about real estate, but now is a time of rare opportunity for investors who have the ability to think and act independently. After several years of highly competitive markets and stellar price growth, the air is cleared for investors seeking strategic opportunities. While prices are still growing in many key markets across Australia, the frenzy has eased in many locations. So investors can buy without the heat of intense competition. And this occurs at a time when vacancies are, are at record lows and rental increases are compensating for higher interest rates. So it's a healthy alignment of positive factors for smart investors who can tune out the media wide noise. So to explore this topic with me for the next uh, 45 or 60 minutes, uh, allowing time for your questions, of course, there's no one better than property investment expert, Tim Graham from Reventon. Tim, welcome. G'day, Terry. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm good. And um, as we were discussing off air just a moment ago, we're finding things still very, very busy in the property investment space. And I think at Reventon, you're finding the same thing. There's no real evidence of any slowdown in activity by uh, real estate consumers? No, I don't think so. We've still been as, as busy as we have been the last 12 to 18 months. I think, um, you know, the topic of today's conversation sums it up. We're, we're starting to see that there's a, a bit of a turn in maybe the FOMO of people that were um, rushing into the market. And um, I think the, there's been a bit of a reflection of the consumer sentiment through, you know, um, you know poor reporting in the media uh, that we're going to have a big demise in the property market. And I think there's probably a little bit of people buying into that, but still seeing a lot of investors in the market at the moment. And we've still been very busy. Great. Good to hear. So, Tim, perhaps we could start off today's uh, discussion with a bit of a temperature check by yourself on where you see markets at around the country. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I put together a little bit of a presentation, which is, a, I suppose, a bit of a temperature check at, at our end for what we're seeing at the moment. Um, and I thought the best way to do that, rather than talking about where we are right now, is to, to go back a little bit and see how we got here. So um, the first thing we've prepared is to think about what happened in 2021. We saw a 20% increase in median house prices nationally in 2021. Uh, we saw the largest uproot of interstate migration in our history, uh, along with a big lifestyle change. We saw a lot of people doing the tree change or sea change movement and I believe that's here to stay um, not, not just for the, the you know the lifestyle aspect but also uh, the affordability aspect and you and I have talked about this for many years Terry um, I think COVID sort of sped it up but it was certainly there well before COVID as well people seeking uh, an affordable lifestyle and they could sell down their homes in the capital cities and maybe pocket a little bit of money by upgrading to a larger block and you know having the nice country lifestyle um, and we're, we're seeing a lot of that throughout COVID, but I do think that was uh, happening well before COVID hit us. And yeah. uh, I don't think we're going to be seeing anybody rushing back to the CBDs anytime soon. No, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, if you look at the population data, Sydney's actually been losing population to internal migration for more than 10 years now. Uh, so that's it's very much people um, leaving the most expensive city in the country and, and looking for somewhere more affordable, a different lifestyle. Um, and... Um, those that suggest that um, when COVID's out, the people will all move back to the city, I think that's unrealistic for a whole host of reasons, including the simple logistics of uprooting your lives and, and relocating um, uh, families, schools, everything, um, employment to another location. Um, it's not that easy to, to reverse that decision and move back, quite apart from the affordability of housing in the big cities that people have left. Absolutely. I saw a statistic this week. There was a uh, prior to COVID uh, happening. I think the Australian average for people working at home is around 4% of the population and that's still sitting around 15% now. Um, I know there are a lot of businesses trying to bring uh, people back. I know for our business here, we've got a pretty flexible work arrangement with our staff, but we are trying to get a bit more consistency with that. So we have have got some you know days where uh, people must be in because we you know you, re you really do lose a bit of camaraderie in the teams and uh, culture is such an important part of the business. So we have got yeah. a few days a, a week where we uh, we say we really want to see any, everybody and you know it's a nice opportunity to you know, see people face to face again, have some lunch, and um, you know that that really does build uh, culture. And I think a lot of business are going to start to do that. Um, there still needs to be a bit of flexibility, of course, but it's got to happen. We've got to get back into these, uh, the, the glass towers and the CBDs are a very expensive asset to have. Okay. So I noticed from just, just looking at the points you've got on screen there, uh, uh, first change of government at a federal level in uh, nine yeah. years, that's, um, that's uh, looking increasingly significant. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and obviously on a on a state level here in Victoria, you know, when uh, I think uh, Daniel Andrews isn't the most popular person in the state for obvious reasons, but um, you know, some recent um, reports that are coming out about uh, some of the infrastructure projects being so far over budget. The um, the uh, train project that we've been doing here for the underground rail is about $200 billion over the uh, budget and years behind. We've just seen the Westgate projects about uh, $2 billion or $5 billion behind as well. So, uh, you know, we could be seeing another change of government here as well over the, uh, the next six months. Yeah. Um, furthermore, with um, uh, other changes that we saw last year, we've obviously started to see the uh, first interest uh, rate hikes this year. First ones in 11 years. We've seen huge disruption to the supply chains uh, with the China port congestion. Um, obviously, the war in Russia and Ukraine uh, has had a big effect on sentiment um, uh, globally. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the FOMO effect, I think that was a really big player. It's not something you really measure, um, you know, through reading statistics on, um, you know, REA or SQM. But I, I certainly saw that last year with so many people just, um, you know, maybe had never thought about investing um, before, but 2021 was the year to do it. And I think uh, there were there was a, a realm of people that wanted to be first time property developers last year as well. Everyone wanted to buy, uh, you know, their first investment property, wanted a big block of land, they wanted to subdivide, everybody wanted everything last year. So I think there has been a little bit of that heat come out of the market, given we have got you know a bit of negativity in the media. But I think what we're seeing there is it's really a consumer sentiment that's changing. And it's not so much that the fundamentals have changed. Um, where we, uh, what's actually happening in the market at the moment as a generalisation is it's an emotional reaction by consumers um, that, to all of those things that I've just listed. And the media has been reporting on this doom and gloom. And obviously what happens when uh, the media starts talking about that is consumer sentiment drops away. Um, but the doom and gloom isn't just in real estate online at the moment, it's in inflation, it's the construction in industry, it's anything that will sell a newspaper. And more importantly, it's ill-informed. Uh, you and I have talked about this, um, you know, in many markets, but I think it's pretty rife at the moment, Terry. Yeah, uh, but, but I think um, the, the latest uh, report on consumer sentiment, which is the ANZ Roy Morgan survey, uh, the one that was published just in the last few days, showing there's actually um, all of their uh, confidence sub indices are up except one, uh, and it's been quite a, a market uplift in uh, consumer sentiment shown in that survey, mm -hmm. which is surprising given all the negative media. But I think there's a there's a lot of pushback from from the public against that media. I think we're starting to see um, some backlash towards media for the you know people are um, I think suffering from doom fatigue. Uh, I yeah. think it's a term we're going to be hearing more and more of that people are just just uh, uh, I just know in my conversations with with colleagues and friends that that people are just uh, fed up with the emphasis on the negative in media and that they're starting to yeah. to switch off. Or... It's re reminiscent of the uh, uh, of COVID when you couldn't be bothered turning on the TV just to, it was just mentally draining. Yes, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, I mean, just one example that the the Courier Mail newspaper in Brisbane ran an absolutely scurrilous art article about a week ago um, with just completely over the top in terms of talking down the market and overstating where things were at. And the the, the online feedback from their readers was um, quite savagely anti what they had written. And I've noticed that in the time since then, they've completely changed the tone of their real estate coverage. I think they've got the message that people are just fed up with it. That at the very least, people want accurate and factual reporting of what's going on, but we're not getting it by yeah. and for media, because what you and I um, both know is that, that the reality of what's happening in markets across the country is quite different from the tone of the media coverage. It's, it's a lot more positive than um, we're being led to believe Absolutely. I think you. it's hard to believe what you're reading when you're turning up to, um, you know, an auction or a walkthrough um, of a, an inspection on a weekend and it's telling the opposite story. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you only got to read, read into that, um, you know, an article like that and then go up and see on a, on a weekend that you're seeing the exact opposite and all of a sudden the rest of the media that you're reading thereafter doesn't make as much sense. No, I think I think it's time also for for some focus on the things that really matter for real estate investors. Um, the equation, you know, and that's the general theme of today's discussion. I know we'll get into it a little bit further as we go through the hour, but um, the most important information for investors right now is not so much about what's happening with prices, but what's happening with um, vacancy rates and rentals. And yeah. that's very timely because at a time when interest rates are rising, uh, there's some major compensatory factors in the mix uh, for property investors to keep in mind. Yeah, I've got a feeling you might have read ahead, uh, read ahead in my presentation, Terry. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, well, well, I just thought I'd touch on that, but not get <laughs> I know you haven't money. seen it yet, but you're on the money. <laughs> uh, okay, well, just keep working through it. And um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's exactly that. The, the facts are that the fundamentals, uh, fundamentals of Australia's economy are just far too strong uh, to be reading into that sort of conjecture. Australia's unemployment rate's the lowest it's been in 50 years. We're at 3.4 percent at the moment. Uh, resale housing supply levels are at record lows. And over the last five years, uh, Australia's population uh, grew by 3.7 million people. And that's without um, uh, any uh, internationals as well, um, I'll add to that. But the delivery of new housing continues to be delayed due to global and domestic material trade issues. So on one hand, we've got uh, the population growing. We don't have the housing to uh, accommodate it. Hmm. Yeah, that, and just touching on all of that and also our, our references to the, the tone of the media coverage, there are increasing numbers of uh, credible analysts and commentators who are actually um, um, making the comment that they believe that some of the forecast for property prices are, are over the top and in some cases they're being labelled ridiculous and ludicrous. But the people who are making those sort of commentary aren't getting the same prominence in media as the people who are, are talking down the market. Uh, that, I think that's one of the factors. But what we tap into every day, we're tapping into media online as part of our research here. So we're very aware of what everyone's saying about prices. And there's actually quite a large body of opinion that um, the market is strong. We're not going to see major price decline. Um, and, and also to the effect that perhaps um, we've already reached the bottom of this, this correction and when things are going to improve from this point on. But those people are not getting prominence in media because media tends to favour the negative sensation. Yeah. And the other thing is that they refer to the Australian property market. And um, as we know, there are many, many markets within the Australian market. Um, you know, we, we quite often label the, the property market as one um, whole market and every single market has got their own little indicators and, um, you know, the own, there are little things that are driving that local economy. Yeah, I, I, we fundamentally believe here that um, real estate markets are, are local affairs. They, they are driven by ha what happens in local economies. And that's why we see so many, right now we're seeing a lot of regional differences um, and we quite, quite often see a correlation between what's happening with capital city markets and what's coming through in reports such as Comsec Standard State Reports, which analyzes and ranks the, the economies around Australia by various criteria. And it's significant to me, for example, that you know, the Tasmanian market in Hobart has risen um, in coincidence with uh, their rise up the economic rankings in that report. And at the same time, the one market that we're finding to be uh, significantly down at the moment of Sydney and regional New South Wales. Um, and that happens at a time when New South Wales actually ranks second last in the ComSec report. So their economy is actually not as strong as it was. And that's what being reflected in what's happening with some of the New South Wales property markets. Yeah, they often refer to almost a two tier market between Melbourne and Sydney being one and then the, the rest. Um, and we've seen that many times when there has been a downturn that Melbourne and Sydney are the first ones to you know, show the reaction. And then you've got a lot of the other capital cities that are a lot slower. I think the Tasmania, um, you know, Hobart, Launceston uh, are probably anomalies in that. And now uh, Adelaide at the moment is probably you know, the first couple of years um, or the first time in many, many years where we've seen such a big significant increase in, in that market. Um, but those markets, much like Brisbane, when we have seen downturns, if there has been any downturn at all, it's been quite minor. Yeah, look, I think you make a good point there because something that I've often observed in contrary, contrast to what media often tells us and what um, sort of bank economists tell us, is there's this kind of view that um, the rest of Australia follows the lead from Sydney and Melbourne. But I've actually found in our observations and research that quite often the opposite is true, that Sydney and Melbourne are often the exception to the national rule. And we've had instances where they've been booming and other places haven't. I and mean, when they've been in decline, such as say 2018, 2019, but that hasn't been happening across the nation. So yeah. I don't think there's any evidence that, you know, Sydney definitely is down overall at the moment, um, but there's no evidence that other parts of Australia are following that trend. And that's normal by my yeah. observation. Absolutely. I think one thing that people um, need to think about when we look at uh, Australian capital cities is there's a cost of living associated with Melbourne and Sydney that just aren't there with a lot of the other, other cities. If we think about a, an interest rate, no matter where you live in Australia, your rates are essentially the same. Um, if you're a, a, a tradie or a teacher living in Adelaide or a tradie or a teacher living in Melbourne, you're on very similar incomes. It could be a small difference, but uh, all in all, your cost of living is going to be a lot cheaper living outside of the Melbourne and Sydney locations. 
conditions. Yeah. Um, and that, that obviously allows for price growth. Um, so what I mean by that is that uh, given your, your income and your interest rate might be here and you're living in a different city over there, um, there's obviously room for this city to actually increase because the, um, the incomes will actually allow that growth. Sure. Okay. So I'll push on a couple of uh, additional facts there. Uh, the housing uh, housing is an essential requirement. It is shelter, and you know for that reason, um, you know we've got a significant undersupply at the moment, and it's up to mum and dad investors to fix the issue. This is something that uh, doesn't get reported on a lot, but you know government's not doing enough um, for this, and this is why things like negative gearing actually exist in this country. It's up to mum and dad investors to actually help with this housing uh, issue. So. You know, overseas migrations just started again. Australia's in desperate need of skilled labour. Uh, you know, the unemployment rate would show that. I don't know if anybody's going to, to cafes and restaurants on the weekend that is noticing this, but, you know, I'm seeing here in Melbourne, some places just can't open because they can't get staff. You know, especially yeah. here in Melbourne specifically when we had such big, um, you know, lockdowns last year, a lot of these people in the in, in hospitality, um, hairdressers, a lot of trades like that, they actually had to go and find other employment. They haven't come back. Uh, and obviously having the borders closed, there, there's a lot of things in tourism. They just can't find the, um, the labour. Yeah. Well, that's right. And, and uh, as you've referenced, the federal government is now talking quite uh, in strong terms about lifting migration numbers to try and fill some of those uh, gaps in employment. Um, but the question that arises in my mind is where are they going to live? We already have record low yeah. vacancies in this country. So that situation... Um, from the investment viewpoint, it is going to um, change for the better from the investor viewpoint, for the worse from the viewpoint of tenants, that um, very low vacancies are going to get um, worse and, and rents are going to continue to rise. Yeah, uh, look, we're going to go through some um, some stats today where I'll show people some, some websites so they can get access to this data. But one thing for sure, supply and demand is what's going to drive um, any property market. And if you're looking at vacancy rates, you know, there is no way that we won't see price growth with the demand being so high in these locations. Um, so furthermore, uh, according to the RBA, Australia, uh, Australians have $260 billion worth of liquidity currently sitting in their mortgages. So household balance sheets have never looked better. When you look at that, that means people have got the flexibility. They're not sitting there you know, struggling to, to make payments on their mortgage. In fact, they're ahead. Um, now, that means that we've got liquidity that can go into other, uh, other investments um, and people trust real estate. You know, they're going to continue to back something that's performed well for them. Um, you know, realistically, with a 20% increase to national um, median prices last year, if you spent, you know, $500,000 on an investment property last year, you would have made hundred grand. You know, Australians like something they can keep. They trust residential real estate. And for that reason, I, I, I can't see that we're going to see uh, these locations starting to go backwards. Um, I think Melbourne and Sydney, you know, as we've mentioned already, they're the ones that do start to go backwards if there is any demise. And I do think there's probably a couple of, or there is some, some suburbs within the, the Sydney and Melbourne markets that might continue to see a little bit of demise. The reason being is that they were actually inflated to begin with. I think they just needed a bit of a reality check. Yeah. And I think um, what, what our analysis shows also is that um, uh, referenced a number of times that Sydney is, is the one place that um, we were seeing, have seen evidence of decline, but it was actually happening ahead of the interest rate plans because we analysed sales activity as a forward indicator of prices. And we found that in the March quarter, there was quite a significant fall off in activity in Sydney ahead of um, the interest rate rises. Um, so there, were, there was something else happening in um, that market that wasn't um, influenced by rising interest rates because they hadn't happened yet. Uh, I think it was um, that the economy was uh, not as strong as before and there was that affordability barrier that had been reached in Sydney, which had, not, which had had a boom from you know 2013 to 2017, which most of Australia didn't have prior to the, the current boom. So um, I think there was... Um, um, some resistance to prices that happened in Sydney ahead of the rest of the country. Yeah. Well, when we when we think about interest rates, it's not just about um, you know uh, what it's going to cost you to pay back the mortgage, but the uh, flow and effect of interest rate increases as people's borrowing capacity is reducing. So banks banks are starting to service you at a much higher amount. What you could borrow twelve months ago on the same income is very different today. Yeah, sure, and that obviously is a factor, but. Um, Overall, as you pointed out, um, the, the position of households is quite strong um, from an employment viewpoint, but also um, the buffers that are in the system in terms of um, people's ability to, to pay mortgages. Um, most people, as you point out, are ahead of their mortgages. Most people have savings 
and most people have equity. And of course, there's also that factor that people are always assessed when they go for a loan, not at the current interest rate, but at the current, right. current interest rate plus three percentage points. Uh, so that buffering is in the system as well. Absolutely. Um, so wage growth is finally happening as well. Um, this has been driven by the skill shortage and this can't be fixed um, without housing. It's simple economics. To increase the population, we need more housing. Um, you know, the largest employer in Australia is the, the government. They're paid by our taxes. In order for the government to increase um, the amount of taxes that we uh, are bringing in, we need to increase, you know, tax payers. Um, this has been around for a long, long time. Obviously, um, you know, we've got an aging population as well. A large portion of the country is moving into retirement, which is taxpayers leaving it. So we do need to backfill that with um, skilled migration. And the only way that we can actually do that is to create more housing for them. Um, this flows on with rental supply volumes continuing to uh, reach crisis levels, uh, hence the sharp increase that we've noticed in, in rents. The past 12 months, the capital city average increase was 9.8%, and the regions, which is obviously somewhere we've been focusing on for a long time, Terry, uh, increased by 10.8%. Now, um, this, this is really evident when you start to look at um, uh, the regions and you start to look at the fact that you know, from where we were 12 months ago, uh, to where we are today, vacancy rates are constricted, which is driving up price growth. And then we're not delivering houses in the same manner. So that's only going to continue to happen until we can fix the um, the supply chain issues as well. Yeah. I mean, it's very significant to me that a number of very, very large projects are being uh, cancelled or deferred by major property developers because the, the rising costs and the shortages of material and tradespeople means that it's just not viable to proceed. So that's just going to add to the shortage of um, available supply, both for rental and for people to buy. And that's going to tend to put further upward pressure on rentals, but out of that also further upward pressure on prices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I always like to say that, you know, success leaves, hits, uh, leaves hints and history um, tells a story. So if we look back to 2017, APRA made some adjustments to tighten credit, uh, and that was off the back of a four-year property boom in Melbourne and Sydney. So the tabloids started crying poor at that time and claimed a national downturn was about to occur. Um, those who bought into that conjecture and sat on their cash instead of uh, looking at the strong fundamentals of the markets all over the country missed out on huge gains. And I've, I've put together a couple of them. And these are areas that we've obviously been focusing on as well over the last few years. But if you looked at um, the three-year gain for Geelong between uh, 2017 and 2019, that should say, um, there was 24% gain in the three years and 74% over the five to 2021. Ballarat also 24% over three years and 100% gain over five. Bendigo 15% and 70%. Uh, Hobart 30% and 90%. And Orange in, New, in um, New South Wales 30% and 107%. Now, the reason I talk about that is because I see a lot of similarities between the 2017 market and where we are today, Terry. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. And uh, a similar syndrome out there, isn't there? And, and we saw it um, early 2020 with me, media uh, done by bank economists were forecasting price decline. A lot of investors decided to wait, and those that waited 12 months ended up paying 100 grand and more for the same property. And we're in a similar situation now where we've got forecasted prices decline, and some people perhaps deciding to wait. But I think the smart investors will be active right now because um, the, there's some um, some great opportunities to be had, and I don't think there's um, it makes any sense to delay based on media sound bites. Yeah, absolutely. I think ultimately, if um, it might sound like a really obvious thing, but when people are thinking about investing at all, whether it's real estate shares or anything it may be, there's a, a common reason that they're doing that. And it might be, you know, for tax deductions, it could be for retirement, whatever it may be. When you're thinking about um, uh, the purpose of buying that investment, I always think you're not buying uh, as a speculator. You're not buying into a, a market in real estate like you do shares where you're buying and selling. That's the difference between an investor and a speculator. Right now, if you believe that you're, you want to use real estate to grow your wealth over the next 10 years, then there's always a good time to buy real estate. It's about making sure that you're spending, you know, you're not over leveraging and making sure that you can hold that real estate for 10 years. Realistically, if you can hold a good property for, for 10 years, whether the market's up, down or and downwards or sideways um, uh, at, at any period of time, over 10 years, you will make money. So it's very important right now that you're looking at the fundamentals of the location you're buying. So that could be, you know, what's the driving local economy? Um, are there, uh, is there a shortfall in, in housing? Are the vacancy rates? 
it's tight, what's, what else is coming to the area, all those fundamentals. If you can pick that over the next 10 years, you will make money. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm, I'm often asked the question, uh, the simple question, is now a good time to buy real estate? And I say it's the wrong question. The right question is where is it a good time to buy real estate? That's right. At any point in time, it's always a good time to buy somewhere. It's just a question of pinpointing the right locations with the right fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my opinion, far too much emphasis gets put on uh, median house prices, and this is what we're seeing reported quite regularly. Um, not only can this uh, statistic be quite misleading at times, but there's often delays in the statistics. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people might not be aware, but when a contract of sale uh, is, is signed today, it takes some time for it to become unconditional, then it come, uh, gets lodged to your, your uh, local state, whether it's your REIV or REIQ, et cetera. It can take months for those figures to start to come through. Um, but vacancy rates are much more in live time. So if you jump on SQM Research, and I'll put the, the website there for any of the viewers that want to see it, that's a, that's a free website. And I think this is one of the most powerful uh, tools that investors can use. We can see on this graph here, you can see trends. Okay, now this is a suburb in Adelaide that we've been selling in. The vacancy rate there for, for July, uh, so last month, was 0.1%, Terry. That pretty much means, if you think about that as a percentage, there's pretty much one doormat in uh, that suburb that's available for rent right now. So incredibly tight rental market. And obviously what that's going to do is drive up your rental yields. Um, to put it in perspective, as far as a, a percentage, we're typically looking anything under 3% is what we would say is a good market. And, you know, there's markets all over the country right now. In most capital cities, it's under 1%. But these are these, these are some of the statistics that I've not seen in my uh, 10 years working in real estate. Yeah. Well, I've been, I've been doing it for a lot longer than that. And yeah. I haven't seen rental vacancy rates this low ever. Yeah. Nor have I seen um, rental increases as strong as we're currently seeing. I think you're right that um, there's too much emphasis in media on what's happening with median prices. Um, what we're always looking for is forward indicator what will happen with prices because what media is telling us is what has recently happened with prices according to certain sources. And quite often they're rubbery figures anyway. But I, what we're interested in is the forward indicators of what will happen with prices. And uh, sales volumes um, are a forward indicator that we, we chart. And they're very strong for most parts of Australia at the moment still. Mm -hmm. But vacancy rates are a very good forward indicator of prices because we have vacancies as low as you're showing us. And with rents rising as strongly as they are, prices will follow that trend. So, yeah. um, and I think they, these are the numbers that investors should be paying attention to, not um, media reports on what's happening um, with uh, media prices. Yeah. To put this figure in perspective, um, I settled one in this suburb three weeks ago uh, for a, an investor it was a, a completed property that we did there, uh, $450,000 purchase. And um, it was a three bedroom, big size block. We actually um, listed that one um, for rent on the Thursday at the first open on the Saturday. And we had 18 applications on that on the first weekend. That's what a 0.1% a vacancy rate looks like. And um, we ended up getting $460 per week for that property. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what we're seeing, because you know, open houses for rental properties are commonly getting those sorts of numbers of this queues of people lining up. And what's happening, one of the mechanisms by which rents are rising is that um, people in that queue are offering more than the asking rent in some cases Absolutely. to beat the competition. And that's one of the reasons why rents are, are rising as quickly as they are, more so than you know, landlords um, you know, squeezing the market. Yeah, well, we manage over 500 um, properties and I can tell you some of the stories I'm hearing from my property managers here at the moment, we've got people offering 12 months in advance just to get, just to get, the, um, um, just to get the, the lease. Yeah, and, and the tragedy of this is that there is not a single politician that I've seen in this country at a state or federal level that's got a policy to deal with this. Absolutely. I've just had, I've just had a federal election and it wasn't even mentioned in the federal, as an issue. I don't think politicians are even aware that the problem exists. Yeah. So Instead, those, Terry, they're slapping, slapping investors with more taxes. And, um, you know, we don't only got to look at what your uh, state of Queensland's doing to <laughs> investors at the moment, which uh, I'd rather not get into, to be honest. <laughs> it's a bit of a sore. Well, yeah, but, but, but that's why we have the rental shortage, isn't it, Tim? Uh, because yeah. there have been a series of decisions at state and federal level and also what APRA has done. Um, it's been going on for about five years intensely and it's um, acted as discouragement. And um, that's why the, the stock of available rental properties has diminished over time to the point where we've got vacancy rates like 0.1%. And if people think that we're, we're citing the extreme cases, believe me, across Australia, there's postcode over postcode. Yeah. 
with um, vacancy rates below 0.5%, somewhere between 0 and 0 0.5 is common. And now, well, that's, uh, this, is, this is why these graphs are important because it's not showing you, you know, one month, two months. It's showing you the trend for the last decade. So, you know, it's if I saw uh, inter, uh, vacancy rates here at 1%, but look back over the last couple of years and are as high as 10, then you've got to ask the question, what, why is it um, low right now? And is it likely to go back to 10%? So being able to analyse that data and actually make sense of it's important as well. It's not just about seeing this month it's that low. We want to see the trends over the last few years years and also look at you know what else could actually affect it moving forward yeah and uh, i think that the key thing is it, it can't be fixed anytime soon um, no that's right so, um, and it's probably going to get worse because we've got um our federal government talking about increasing migration to fill the, the jobs vacancies we've got major projects being cancelled because of the cost issues um all sorts of reasons why vacancies are probably going to get lower where they can before they get better. I just want to remind everybody out there watching and listening that if you've got any questions, please uh, type them into the either the chat box or the Q&A panel. We will have time before the end of the, the one-hour broadcast to, to deal with as many of your questions as we can. Excellent. Um, so I suppose the question is, will we see a repeat of 2017? And um, my opinion is that some markets are, in fact, overpriced. I sort of mentioned uh, Melbourne and Sydney in some cases. I do think that there's some suburbs there where the FOMO effect has been rife. And, um, you know, I must say, you know, as a buyer's uh, agent as well, even in the markets I am selling in, you know, my job is to, to find my client's value. And I'll be honest, over the last, um, you know, six to 12 months, there's been many a times where my clients have lost deals. I've, I've gone in to bat for them and I've said, we're at this price here. Somebody else is prepared to pay that and I'm not going to tell them to go higher. So it's become, and this is why I say it's finally a buyer's market. I'm actually glad that there's been a little bit of a slowdown in um, sentiment because people were going in and paying way too much for properties. Um, you know, there's a, a, there is a bit of a formula to work out what, what a property is worth. And that doesn't just come down to, you know, your eyes. It comes down to how are you going to uh, be funding that project? What type of rent can I be getting? So there is a, um, you know, there are some smarts around identifying where you tap out on these uh, these properties. So uh, there's a few markets I, mean, I think we'll start to see uh, some further demise, and I just think it's, it's needed. Um, and as I said, Melbourne and Sydney in particular. Um, other areas like in Brisbane, I think we've have seen because of the, you know, the everybody last year wanted to buy in Brisbane. I sort of tapped out of Brisbane. It will not, not in complete, completely out of Brisbane, but sort of tapped out as, as Brisbane uh, putting so much of a priority because I do think so many suburbs did reach the top of the uh, property cycle there. Um, so we started looking for some, uh, you know, regional plays uh, instead of looking at Brisbane specifically. Um, I do think that the growth, growth that we've seen in, in Brisbane has been significant, but that's off the back of not a lot of growth for many years before that, which people need to remember. And um, it's, I suppose, because of the Olympic Games and things like that, any investor, you know, starting out, everybody had heard Brisbane is the place to go. But if you're hearing that from your friends at a barbecue, it could be too late. And that'd be my advice. Make sure you're, you're really looking at, um, you know, is there still room to grow in these markets? And again, I tie that back to uh, the incomes within the area. So I believe that um, price growth in um, some suburbs are directly related to interest rates and to incomes. And as I mentioned before, I gave the comparison that whether you're living in Melbourne or Sydney as a, a tradie or a, a teacher, your incomes are probably very much the same. Your interest rates will be the same, but median price is very different. So the reason that we've been able to see such uh, price growth in some of these areas is because the affordability uh, of those incomes would allow the growth. But now we've seen interest rates go up, meaning that the serviceability rate has gone up, it's a lot harder for those markets to go up. So my question to people right now is, if you are looking to invest, where's the best places to be uh, looking? It's where your, where your banks will actually allow you to afford, and then how much um, rent contribution you're going to get into those to make sure that you're at least neutral and hopefully positive. Sure. Yeah, and um, I think um, you know, increasingly, What's showing up in our analysis of markets is the more affordable areas of the cities that, that are strongest in terms of sales activity and, and upholding of prices, and also regional markets that have um, you know, identifiable growth drivers that offer that higher level of affordability in the cities. Those are the ones that are, that are strongest at the moment. They also offer the better yields, and um, that's an important factor at the moment. So... Um, I suppose there's a danger of people perhaps chasing yield too much, Tim, but um, I think yeah. uh, if you choose your location wisely, you can get a, a very nice balance between um, 
a good yield at time in times of rising interest rates and also the criteria for long-term sustainable growth. Absolutely. We've got to touch on that possibly in this uh, next slide. So um, I always say that timing, uh, time in the market is more important than timing the market. A lot of people are looking for, you know, waiting for prices to come back. And I can tell you now, if you're waiting for prices to come back and they don't, all you're doing is getting further and further behind the eight ball. So um, my recommendation for anybody who is trying to time that market, look, be smart with your money. Don't go and just jump into anything, but analyze that property um, to, uh, from a financial perspective. So if you were to take on a loan at X amount, take into account your setup costs and stamp duty. If I get this amount of rent, what are my outgoings? And if it's still break even point, I think you click go. Don't sit there and wait because if you're looking at the right markets, they're not going to come back, truly. So I believe it is, there is always a good place. Uh, it is always a good time to buy real estate. The question is where. Um, so uh, on to your point, Terry, in relation to the yields, I think investors need to be realistic uh, with their yield expectations now. We've seen, as I was mentioned last year, a 20% uh, national increase to medians. We've seen some uh, good areas up to 40, 50% in 12 months. If you're looking at new build, you've got to also take into account we've seen a 30% increase to construction costs. So if you look, go and look at the, those two things combined, your price growth, um, sorry, your uh, price growth and your uh, cost to actually produce that product has increased significantly. And obviously, if that's gone up by 30, 40%, rents can't increase by 30, 40% over the same period. So they might have gone up by 9, 10%, depending on whether you're city or, or regions. You do need to take into account that you're not going to get the same yields as you did 12 months ago. So be realistic with your expectations on that. Yeah. I'd also urge people when, when they're thinking about yield, don't just think about the yield um, that exists at the time that you buy it. There are, there are a couple of projections because we're living in times where rents are rising very strongly at the moment. Do, do a calculation. What will my yield be in one year's time? What will my yield be in two years time? Because you know, basically if you buy a, a, a property for 400,000 and the rent's 400 a week, that's a 5% roughly rental yield. If rents increase 10% in the next year, your yield will go up to 6.5%. And if they increase another 10% the following year, your yield will be, be above 7%. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's a time when people need to consider that factor, that um, it's not just the yield at the time that you buy. What will it be in two years time? Yeah. And I think like um, what a lot of people don't realise when they're looking at yield is that there's a gross and a net yield. So you've got to take into account when you're looking at the property, are there likely to be more further expenses on this? Is it a bit older? Are there body corps? What is your actual true out-of-pocket expense on this property? Because you can have the, you know, the, the, the greatest um, gross rental yield um, you know, known to man, but if you've got huge body corps or a big sinking fund and anything else that's like likely to come up as an expense, all of a sudden your out-of-pocket expense is going to be a lot higher and your net yield is going to be much lower. Yeah. Um, so uh, I put in there uh, today a bit of an FAQ. So these are the most regular questions that I'm getting in today's market. So uh, I thought it'd be good for our viewers today. A lot of them have probably got similar questions. So I thought rather than waiting for, to the end just to get the question, we'll obviously have time for that as well. But I'll throw in some of the most commonly asked questions that I'm getting in today's market. So the first one I get is I'm looking to invest right now. Uh, should I be buying new or should I be buying established property? Now, obviously, again, if we're looking at what we're hearing in the media right now, every builder in the country is apparently going broke. <laughs> so it's a concern for everybody. I want to uh, put a little bit of uh, context to that uh, for people today. It's one thing to be concerned about these things. It's one thing to understand what you're actually reading in there. And I, I, not that I do a lot of work with Metricon, I actually really feel for those guys because every single time there's any uh, talk of a, a builder going, um, going broke or having any types of concerns, Metricon's name gets pulled through the mud again. Those guys, in my opinion, are still in a very strong position. Um, you know, they've raised a lot of money. I know they've let go some staff um, over the last uh, couple of months, but that was actually a reflection of market conditions of, you know, there is a slowdown in the retail space. Um, but look, truly, I do believe that a lot of the builders' problems have gone, um, you know, the worst of it might be behind us. To put into perspective why we did see a lot of these builders go into liquidation over the last uh, 12 months was that a lot of them did have fixed price contracts. Now, um, their contracts do allow, even on a fixed price contract, and this is another question that pops up in a minute, there, there is the ability for a builder prior to construction starting for them to come back to you and say, look, we've just had a look at um, you know, what it's going to cost us to build this house. We quoted you 300000 It's going to cost us 50000 We've got given you the option. 
either pay the extra 50000 and stay with us or here's your deposit back and you can find somewhere else. They're well within their rights to do that. And I know, um, you know, for a consumer, nobody wants to pay that extra 50000 but we also don't want builders going broke either. It's not good for, for anybody. Um, they're not necessarily uh, saying, I want to increase my margin. They're saying, we don't want to lose on this property, uh, on, on, on this build, and we're asking you uh, to increase it. By all means, you don't have to. So what does it mean? You can go back out to the market and find another builder. It's likely you will be parking, paying the market market rate and if the original build is being fair with you you should be they should be on par so the first thing I would do is look at why a lot of these builders actually did go broke. They had fixed price contracts and uh, they might have had 200 of them in the ground. Obviously, there's a pretty well-known builder in Queensland last year that went into liquidation. They had 180 builds in the ground at the one time. Now, if you're losing $50,000 on one contract, you know that's a hard hit for any builder. But if you're losing 200, uh, sorry, you're losing 50 grand across 200 builds at the same time, that'll bring any business unstuck. So it's important, yes, be diligent, but also understand what you're actually uh, what's what's in the market understand what these problems are there are a lot of tools that you can use to go out and actually do your due diligence on the builders i run um you know Ilion dun and bradstreet reports on delinquency on my builders i look at the qbcc and look for any um you know if there's been any defect challenges if their um, licenses have had any challenges looking at whether or not they're uh, still licensed to begin with there's lots of these tools that you can actually lean on and that's why using a company like uh, ourselves at reventon this is what we do we We've done over 200 new build, uh, sorry, done over 2,000 new build contracts. Um, you know, that means that we've got the experience and we know what to look for. And it's really important that you lean on people that do this day in, day out to ensure that you're not getting yourself into bed with a, a problem. So do I believe that you should be looking at new or established? The answer is it's up to your personal circumstances. You need to look at um, you know, what's existing in your portfolio. What are, what are your um, current goals? What are your, um, your deposit needs look like? Because obviously with a, an established property, your deposits need to be higher. You're going to be paying much higher stamp duty. You've got to take into account maintenance, all those types of things. You might have buyer's advocacy fees on the established where you might, not on the new. Lots of these factors. So all I'm saying in this is, don't, uh, don't pigeonhole yourself into one. Look at the numbers, take advice from your brokers, look at um, you know, what your budget will allow and then make an informed decision uh, on that. I know you probably get asked these questions a lot as well, Terry. Absolutely. Um, it's, you know, it's a recurring question at the moment. Um, um, amongst others, um, the obvious ones about interest rates, et cetera, but yeah, there's a lot of questions always um, at any time. Um, yeah. Is it better to buy new or established? Uh, but particularly now with what's happening in the building uh, construction sector. Yeah. And look, I think it's, um, you know, advice that I give to people all the time is that if you're looking to any uh, to anybody, um, you know, as a, an expert in their field in property or in finance, you need to be asking them that what they're doing with their own personal investments. Um, and I can tell you now for myself, I do both, both new and established properties, and, and I'm still building new builds in this market. And the reason being is I'm really confident in the builders that I've selected. I've done my due diligence. I'm, you know, I'm checking that they uh, are paying cash for their, um, you know, their, their timber, all these types of things where you can do delinquency checks you know they're paying things on time i'm seeing that my clients are getting their bills done in um you know in reasonable time frames all those types of things so it's important that you don't rule out uh, either or and a lot of um a lot of people actually think if i buy an established property it's going to be faster i can tell you now that's not always the case there's two things that you, um, people may not realize about the established market one is it's certainly not a fixed price you might think you're saving money i can tell you now there's a lot more eyes on your project or, or that that one particular block of land or that long one particular uh house than there is in the new build space because if that uh, block of land with that build is no longer there because somebody else has bought it there's a very good chance that you're going to get one very similar and it's a fixed price in the established market, you're competing with the masses. Now, in order for you to find your budget, in order for you to find the, the house that ticks all the boxes, I, I, I'm estimating at the moment the average turnaround to find the right place would be at least three months. Okay, so there's a lot to think about, and that's why I say always look to get advice on these things. Now, um, the next question I've got uh, a lot of in the last 12 months is um, people are coming to me and they've been you know, building with a retail builder uh, and the builders come back and said that they need to increase the cost. What are your rights? What can you do? What can't you do? Um, my advice would be you have got a conveyancer for this reason. Okay, so first and foremost, go back and seek uh, some legal advice from them. Um, if it's a HIA contract, they uh, the builder would be bound by um, the, the laws that are um, uh, within that contract. My um, what uh, my experience tells me is that 
with most of these uh, requests, it's not a, you have to pay this. My uh, experience is they're saying to you, we don't want to lose money on this contract. And if we do it at this price, we will lose money. What we're suggesting is we need to increase that so that we can keep the same margin that we originally had. And you can either choose to move forward with this with the same design and all those types of things, or we can go back to market and here's your 5% deposit back and you start again. The, the long and short of it is nobody saw these huge um, delays happening with um, you know uh, supply chains. No one saw the, the huge shortage of um, trades. Obviously, the home builder grant put a, a lot of stress on the industry. No one saw this coming. And what the builders are trying to do is trying to be fair with you. Not every builder, but most of them. So my advice would be go back out to market, get somebody like myself to come out and help you. We can go out and we can go to tender again. We can find three different properties before you cancel the old, uh, old one, get new build prices and see whether your build's fair. That's the answer. So you're not bound to have to continue with that. You're not bound to continue at all. But what you should be looking at is, is it a fair price? Is what they're asking fair? And if it's not, you have got grants to get your deposit back and you can work out what you do from there. Okay. The next question I've, uh, I'm getting a lot regularly at the moment uh, with interest rates going up is now a good time to refinance. A lot of people are saying to me, well, I had such good rates. You know, next time I go to refinance, I'm probably going to be paying a high rate. Why would I do that? And why wouldn't I just take the variable rate that the bank's going to assign me? My um, my advice is uh, on this, there are a lot of rebates that are starting to come out into the market. So make sure you're at least uh, stress testing your uh, current loans. There might be better opportunities out there, not just from an interest rate perspective. Interest rate's not everything. Making sure you've got the right structure, thinking about what your goals are in the future. Uh, if I'm going into a fix right now, what happens if I'm trying to buy an investment property or an equity lease or trying to make changes in the future? Will I have to have a break fee and will that break fee be too exhaustive, which means it could prohibit me moving forward? So lean on your brokers. Make sure that you are, they're actually understanding what your goals are and it's not all about the interest rate. Last but not least is um, why should I buy, um, use a buyer's agent? Okay. Um, Obviously, by using a buyer's agent, you can save money. Um, you can tap into our expertise. And we don't, we're not just a, a local real estate agent. We don't just know our area. We're experts in areas all over the market. We've got a team of experts here that um, look through the data, much like yourself, Terry. I know you've got a big team there. We're scouring the country for opportunities. So you're actually going to open yourself up to opportunities, not just in uh, your local postcode. Obviously, that's going to allow you to have diversification within your portfolio as well. We can no negotiate on your behalf. People always think that's about price. It is not always about price. It's about the terms. It's about understanding the laws within every state. Every single state in uh, Australia has different laws. Now, if you've got a good buyer's agent that does interstate, they will know how to use those laws to your advantage. So uh, this can save you an enormous amount of time. It can save you an enormous amount of money. It can also give you opportunities to, mark, uh, to off market opportunities. So Terry, um, that's pretty much it for my presentation. Uh, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to, to throw into that before we go to Q&A. Look, I'd just like to reinforce what you're saying about the, the merits of using a, a good buyer's agent. Um, I always do. Um, I don't lack expertise and knowledge, certainly, and information, but I am time poor. And um, I just, just like um, having, having a professional on board who, who can go and do the legwork for me, who can organise the inspections, um, and, and bring a level of expertise and another set of eyes. Um, and all of that, I think, is valuable and worth paying for. So uh, I think probably now more than ever in the current climate, um, have, having a, a good buyer's agent on your team is, is a really smart investment. Um, yeah. I think it's false economy not to do it. And I think there's too many investors out there that, that try to skimp on advice, um, are reluctant to pay for good advice or reluctant to pay for good information. And I think it's false economy, the worst kind of false economy, in fact, when you're a property investor. Um, spending those small, small bits of money before you spend the big bit of money makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we've got some questions? We do. Um, we've got um, quite a few already in the system. Please, people, um, just, just type your questions into the chat box of the Q&A panel. Normally saying another brilliant and highly informative webinar. Thank you. What are the key regional markets that you both like in Queensland? Uh, you did mention in your presentation, Tim, that you'd done a bit of buying in Brisbane, that you, but you then sort of um, pivoted a little bit more to regional Queensland. What's, what sort of areas do you like there? 
Yeah, there's quite a few. Look, we did a lot of work in the Sunshine Coast um, from 2016 onwards. Um, as I mentioned today, in the five year from from 2017 to 2021, uh, yeah. that market grew about 100. percent So you doubled your money in in the five year period there. So I really like the Sunshine Coast. I do believe it's probably uh, a bit beyond people's affordability now. Um, so I've haven't done anything up there for some time, but I'll be really keen on the Toowoomba market. I know we've had a couple of sessions on that before. I, I love that. I bought there myself. Um, Toowoomba is obviously a beautiful regional city. Um, I actually relate it. Uh, I did a document called Compare the Pair, and that document actually uh, refers to um, Ballarat. Ballarat to Melbourne, Toowoomba to Brisbane. Incredibly similar. In fact, um, when you look at the economic output of uh, Toowoomba, it's far better than Ballarat. And I was uh, buying in Ballarat at in the 200 and 300 thousands back in 2016. Um, the Toowoomba market, in my opinion, is still undervalued. We've got some of the biggest infrastructure projects in Australia uh, affecting that market at the moment, including yeah. the inline rail trail, uh, Boeing injecting a $1.8 billion um, aerospace engineering, uh, aerospace uh, program there. Lots of things like that. So that market really appeals to me. I think Yapoon's another exciting market. There's a lot. Yeah, yeah I, I like you. I mean, I, I'm also personally buying in Toowoomba. In fact, it settles in a couple of days. I think it's just, oh, just yeah. such a such an amazingly good buy, knowing everything that's happening in that economy and, what, and what's coming up. Uh, the best is yet to be seen in that market. It's still, um, it's had some growth, but it's still very affordable and the rental yields are good and the vacancies are incredibly low. So it ticks a lot of boxes. Uh, I think Rockhampton's also a market that's got a lot of appeal. I think Gladstone is now worthy of being considered again. It's, uh, I know investors got burnt there in the past, uh, but it's uh, what's happening there is a lot more sane and solid than in the past. Um, plenty of other options in, in regional Queensland as well. Um, uh, like just on the Toowoomba, Terry, the, the rents there are unbelievable. I, um, I'm doing a new build there, which I bought maybe eight months ago. I think that probably owes me about 510 and the rental appraisal we just uh, got on that is about 580 to 620 a week. Yeah. It's yeah. Yes, you're right. The rents are very strong and, and they're, they're likely to continue to be because there's a lot of jobs going to be coming into uh, the Toowoomba market, particularly when the Indian Rail Link hub is there and the businesses, you, you mentioned Boeing, but there's a lot of other really big business enterprises that are establishing there beside where their rail hub and the, the new Wellcamp Airport are situated. And that's going to be bringing further pressure to the rental market there. There's uh, the largest um, medicinal marijuana um, farm yeah. in Australia going in there as well. It's 1,500 employees. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And they're, they're building a billion dollar hospital as well. So there's a lot, lot happening there. Mm -hmm. uh, Brendan, who's most at risk in the current market? Is someone locked into a new build purchase at the maximum buying capacity at market peak around January this year? Um, does that question sort of make any sense to you, Tim? Uh, could you ask a question again, sorry? Who's most at risk in the current market, i.e. Uh, someone who is locked into a new build purchase at their maximum borrowing capacity at market peak? My, well, I suppose my advice on uh, that would be, um, you know, no one's locked into anything. Right. There's always something that you can do to change it. If you're concerned about that, why wouldn't you, you know, contact your builder? Maybe you need to reduce, uh, you know, you've already paid a 5% deposit. However, um, that might mean that you can still make some changes. There might be the ability for you to scale back a little bit. The second thing I would look at is um, to say um, if you've maxed out your borrowing capacity, that's something that's happened earlier. I'd be I'd be saying we need to you know review that and say, are there any ways that we can um, you know strengthen the the, the finance up? Application. Is there a way that we can do a, um, you know, a higher LVR, which is going to mean that you've got a little bit more deposit to give yourself a buffer? You know, um, when you say that uh, it's maxing you out, have you looked at what the rent's likely to be by the time you complete? Because that could be in a better position than when you originally anticipated. But first and foremost, there's plenty of people out there that you can ask questions of. And the more people that you ask, the better um, uh, informed you're going to be. Okay, so Avanash is, is referring to some of the information you gave us, Tim, earlier about um, you know the construction costs have gone up thirty percent. He's just asking with rents not keeping up with that, is it still feasible um, to, to undertake those sorts of investments? 
Yep. So look, it's really easy to do a cash flow analysis on any property. Um, you know, we've got some great software called a, a PIA, which is a property investment analysis. Really simple. If anybody wants to, I'm going to put my uh, QR code for meetings up on the, the screen shortly. But anybody who wants to run a cash flow analysis on anything that they've got coming up or existing, more than happy to help people with that. All we've got to do is put in there what the expected rent would be, what the likely interest rate would be, put in there the actual loan structure, and we'll quite simply, you know, very easily, it's just a, you know, like a profit and loss on a business. We can quite easily work out week to week, month to month, what it's going to look like. Okay. Ellen's asking for our thoughts on, on the Perth market. It's one that uh, we're particularly interested in. We've recently analysed from the viewpoint of sales activity. It's very, very strong at the moment. And um, I think it's one of the markets that's really worthy of consideration from an affordability viewpoint um, and uh, potential for growth. How do you see it? Look, it's not a market that I've uh, we have gone into. Uh, we have in previous years. Um, I, I I personally always just look at okay, what's my budget, and do is there any uh, opportunities that tick the boxes better than that location? And my answer is I do believe there are better locations. Um, it's not that I don't think that it is a good market, but I must say, of all the people that I do reviews with, people that have um, you know come to us and they've already bought over there, they seem to be the problem uh, child. I'm afraid, and that might have been that they paid too much in the past. Um, but look, for me, I just see better value in a lot of other locations. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think I think it's worthy of consideration. But there are other markets that I too would would rank it. Yeah. With Adelaide would be one of those, uh, but also some of the regional markets. Um, Levent is asking um, which suburbs of Melbourne's west would you invest in? Uh, where is a good place? Uh, to find the correct data to make informed decisions. Well, two questions there. Um, Tim, you're, you're uh, located in Melbourne. Uh, what, what do you think of the, the prospects in the sort of the Western part yeah. of the Melbourne market? Look, I, I'm a bigger fan of the north and northwest, I suppose, um, um, mainly because of the uh, Ontario roads, you've got great new train stations out there, new hospital going out in the northwest. But if you look at Melbourne's urban growth boundary, that's where the growth has to go. It's where we've got room. That's where we've got land. Um, so I do believe over the next decade for, for Melbourne specifically, that north and northwest um, corridor will be where most of the growth or the best growth would be. Um, suburb specific, I actually quite like the, the north, like your Donnybrooks and your Beveridges, um, out to um, uh, Melton. So those pockets I quite like. Uh, as far as where to find the data, um, I can tell you Terry Ryder does some very good reports. So if you want to uh, grab some reports off Terry, they honestly, we buy them as a business. We buy reports off Terry because um, it's so much easier to see from a lot of different locations rather than you running over to you know a million different websites. Terry literally compiles it in the same spot. So my advice would be lean on Terry for that because there are some great reports and I personally buy them myself. So um, that's where you're going to get the best um, uh, results all in one place. Otherwise, Otherwise, you've just got to look at um, your local government um, data, but it's very hard for a you know the layman to consume that. And what I do like about Terry's reports is he puts it in easy to read and easy to consume um, information for the layman. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, Steve, there, Terry. Yeah, well, well, yeah, but I think <laughs> yeah, the truly. point. But I think that the central point is that the reason why we have a business is there's, there's no way you can go for it that has all the information in a nice, neat little package. It all exists out there, but it's, it's in dozens of different places. Yeah, it's how, how you decipher it. Yeah. yeah, and that's right. It's not just finding the information. You, you need to be able to make sense of it, and that's where a lot of consumers struggle. Um, Steve's asking about... I was going about, to touch on that as well, Terry. One of the things that people often uh, say is they go, what? can I go and just do this stuff myself? You've told me where to go, right? But the next part is I said, go and buy in Adelaide, which suburb, what location, which estate, um, you know, what type of uh, budget should I be spending, all those types of things. But we spend, you know, literally millions of dollars, literally uh, on our team, trying to find these locations. And it's something we've done very well over the years, but even software, we'll spend $3,000 a year on near maps, right? So we can literally uh, go and track progress of infrastructure projects. We can see, you know, uh, estates, how far that next stage is coming along. These are all things that we spend so that we know that the information we've got is accurate and it's the most up to date. These are things that no consumer is gonna go and spend. Yeah, sure. Uh, Steve is asking whether you have any views on co-living or NDIS property for investment. Yeah, look, I, I not to say that you can't make money on uh, NDIS. Um, I personally looked into that when it first came out. 
And the more that I looked at it, the, the less I liked, to be completely honest. And the reason being, what a lot of people, anytime you look at something that gives you a higher yield, first and foremost, I say you're most likely going to detract a little bit on, um, on capital growth. It, they never seem to go high, uh, high capital growth, high yield. They never seem to go, um, you know, even Stephen anyway. What happens is if you get a high yield, you'll probably trade off a little bit of growth. If you have a high growth, you might trade off a little bit of yield. NDIS, the reason I say that you'll trade off a little bit of growth is because you're actually building a commercial asset. It's not your typical home that you're going to sell to another you know, homeowner in the future. So you'd want to hope that the next person buying off that, uh, that off you still sees the same potential as that you did. The challenge that you have with those um, that I found looking at the, um, the, the tenancies within that is that um, they all work really well when they work well. But the years that they don't, or the time that you don't have uh, vacancy, when you do have vacancies in there, because you've got multiple rooms that you're letting out, it's working really well when you've got 100% occupancy. When it's not going well, it's it's going to be costing you money. The other thing is, that, um, you know, from a finance perspective, you know, some banks don't like them. The second part is the LVR has got to be a lot higher. So you're going to, probably going to have to have a, uh, a larger deposit. Your construction costs will be higher. There's a lot of things that I didn't like. And I just think that for us, if you get an extra $100 a week in yield, that's not going to change your life, but an extra hundred grand a year in growth will. So my um, uh, approach with a lot of my clients, depending on where they are in their working life, we're targeting growth. And for us, I, I like to target something that's going to give me, you know, a lot better opportunity to leverage in the future. And I just don't feel that NDIS would. Now, in saying that, the co-living stuff, I do some shared living um, projects for clients that have got a higher borrowing capacity. Uh, and again, it's a commercial project, but that can give you upwards of, you know, 8 to 12% rental yield. Those projects are quite specific um, uh, to a higher net worth individual that can afford those projects. They're a very, very good yield play, but I do see growth in these projects as well. So for anybody that's interested in that, I can talk them through uh, those types of projects. But I, I say to investors all the time, I personally have a reasonable property portfolio and I don't play in that space. I like something where a, a, a mum and dad with a nice a couple of kids wants to rent that property in a suburb that people want to rent uh, for a long time. That's where the safest uh, investments are. That's where you'll have the highest occupancy level. And that's where we can find growth if we choose the suburbs um, correctly. I use that personal formula myself and that's what I recommend to my clients. Okay. As always, we, we run out of time and we haven't got <laughs> through um, a lot of the questions, um, but that's always the case, unfortunately. Um, Tim, if, if people want to follow up and who haven't had their questions answered or just have um, uh, an interest in talking to you further about opportunities, how, how do they make uh, contact and follow up? Yeah, sure. So on the screen at the moment, you'll see a QR code. You simply grab your, your mobile phone, put the camera over top of that and it pull up a, a link to my calendar. For anybody out there that wants to book a, a discovery session, obviously free of charge. Um, I literally love having a chat if you haven't noticed that and I'm pretty passionate about what I do. So anybody who wants to jump on there and, and ask any questions about their existing portfolio or anything that um, they're looking to do in the future, more than happy to have a consultation with them. Uh, obviously, um, you know, no, nothing that needs to come off the back of that but if you want to have a chat about your existing portfolio i always believe that if i um, give you my time now i might get some business off you in the future and obviously the other thing is it's not all about property with Reven time we can help you with accounting financial planning property management there's a lot that we can help so anybody interested feel free to book a time okay thank you for that tim thank you everybody out there for your participation today for your comments and questions sorry we didn't get to answer all of them but if you'd like to follow up with tim i'd encourage you to do so and uh, thank you, Tim Graham from Reventon for a very informative um, presentation and uh, lots of um, very, very useful views. I've certainly had a, in the, the Q&A in the chat box, uh, lots of people making favorable comments about um, the information that's been presented today. Uh, let's do it again soon. Um, you know, we're, we're living in dynamic times. and I think people are thirsty for yeah. uh, news and views to, to, to form an opinion on what they should be doing right now. Very good. Thank you very much, Terry. Okay. And thank you, everybody. Bye for now. Good on you. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.